throughout those years, I was able to start transitioning, like I said, doing educational institutions and going to, you know, non-conventional education programs. And that kind of forced me into the world of network marketing. So I was mm -hmm. involved with multiple different network marketing companies, which taught me one valuable lesson, the mindset, the mindset and motivation behind them. Regardless of what product line it is or the service that they sold, I realized that they created a community and they pumped each other up and it was a like-minded entrepreneurial community. So that really kind of got me engaged with learning more about motivation and attending more of these events where I then at about 21, 22 years of age, you know, met my first mentor on stage, Richard Dolan, who changed my life forever. And I saw him speak on stage once. And that was one thing that I was always fearful for was public speaking. So when I, when I saw him on stage for the first time, that kind of really shifted my mindset. And the conference that I was at at the time was one of the largest real estate investment networks in all of Canada. So I was learning about real estate. I was learning about multifamily and all these investors that had these doors. And it was a premium membership pricing, but it got me into the gates of real estate and learning now, okay, I see real estate being the biggest asset class. I see it being a powerful source. It can give me the residuals I want. Now it's how do I immerse myself in it? A lot of people try to jump into the game of real estate without understanding it first, or they go to an entry point level of getting a license and going out and transacting. Well, for me, you know, growing up even younger ages, my favorite childhood toy was Lego. So, you know, Lego was kind of that, that breaking point for me to be like, you know what, what if I could do this in real life? So I was always interested in the development concept more so of any part of real estate. So at 22, 23 at the time, my dad was also, you know, in a, he had, he was an investor in a small residential portfolio where he would have a partner that would kind of tear down some houses and they would build them up into duplexes and they would go one by one every couple of years. So at 22, I decided to, you know, get my education more so on the real estate side, connect with the right people, level up my skill sets and took over my dad's six figure portfolio at that time and converted everything into commercial. I found commercial was the game that I wanted to play because it was inspiring and empowering business owners to start their mom and pop shops. So we ended up, you know, buying three small single family homes, tearing them down and built our first commercial retail oh, wow. strip. And that was kind of the, the, the catalyst towards all the commercial real estate deals I've done since. Hi guys, my name is Jay Dehan. I'm the owner of Next Gen Wealthy and I'm here to serve people. I'm here to help people connect with people. I realized in a time of day and age that we live in with technology taking over, it's about learning how to connect through conversation. So I really use the language to be able to now connect people together. I come from immigrant mentality parents that, you know, immigrated to Canada back in, you know, the 80s. Uh, my mom's from England, my dad's from India, so quite the traditional background. So they're Indian as well, too. So coming into Canada was kind of interesting because they wanted a better life for their generation. That was the biggest thing that they moved across the world for. So they tried very hard to work as hard as they possibly could, extra hours in order to just put food on the table for us. And that was kind of in my earlier years, you know, kind of going paycheck to paycheck and struggling to become that, you know, immigrant family to really kind of adopt the Western culture. But, you know, along the lines, it was very interesting because my dad got positioned in a good, you know, after being a taxi driver and building basements, he was able to start his own business. So mm -hmm. him and a couple of partners put together an Indian grocery store. And I think that's what kind of was the changing factor to everything that allowed us in, you know, my, my kind of mid teen years to be able to at least have access to a little bit of money that gave us a little bit more of the freedom and comfortability to be able to go and pursue what we wanted to do as, as, mm -hmm. as children. And, and maybe even uh, an even bigger gift than that, which maybe you hadn't thought of this before, but I mean, uh, so many, so many people that we've interviewed and so many uh, other entrepreneurs have had entrepreneurial parents, you know, so, so you were, uh, you were sort of indoctrinated to that, that train of thought early on. Would you say that that really, you know, kind of changed the trajectory of your life and realized what, what's possible? It's kind of interesting because I have an older sister and we always say the nature versus nurture concept because she definitely went down the traditional path of schooling and career choice. And I kind of went down the entrepreneurial path. It was interesting from the upbringing of my parents. I think it was definitely the sense of freedom. When I would see my parents working the corporate style jobs when we were younger, it was very time constraint. They didn't have that flexibility. Whereas in with the business, you know, my mom was able to stay at home with us and take us traveling and do certain things while, you know, dad worked worked his job and worked his business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I love it. I love it. And, and obviously, so did you, did you go down the path of any schooling? I mean, obviously you did high school and that, but did you go to college or anything like that? Or 
the thing with high school for me was even high school, you know, I'm a high school dropout. I didn't end up finishing high school at that time. It was me kind of in my own world. And that's why I'm such a believer and advocate for teenagers, especially in this day and age. You know, when I was 17 years old, I was lost and confused. I was, you know, getting involved with the wrong people. I was skipping classes, you know, things in school didn't really interest me the way that I felt that I wanted to learn. So I chose the rebellious path that allowed me to not finish school. However, right after that, I said to myself, I said, listen, there's two ways that I can do this. I can either be known as the high school dropout and saying that I didn't educate myself, or I can go out there and I can educate the way that I want to. So I ended up attending some of the institutions like the universities and colleges in my, in my, in my city, but doing more certification and diploma programs, going out there and, you know, getting a, a diploma in accounting, getting into the real estate development side of things, going out and pursuing psychology and economics to start giving myself a wide variety of skill sets at an early age that kind of helped propel me to start looking into things like motivation and coaches and mentors and speakers online that kind of really then changed the trajectory of my life. I love that. I love that. And that's, that's very similar to, to my path too. Um, you know, I never went to college either, but I, I just started taking classes that I was, that I was interested in. Right. You know, I wanted to get into real estate. So I took real estate classes. I, I always was into business. So I took business classes, but I was never doing it to get, you know, a degree or anything like that. I just wanted the knowledge. Um, so that's, that's amazing that you did that. Uh, so, so what was, what would you say is your, for you, what was your first business that you started and what was it and how did you get into it? So my first business was right out actually out of high school. It's uh, you know, a friend of mine and we came together. We said, you know what? I think the best way to do this is to have residual income. It was big when the you know network marketing was first starting out. And we said, you know what? Let's buy a couple of vending machines, set them up, and then we'll have residual income. <laughs> you know, easy plan. Mm-hmm. Little did we know there was a lot more maintenance involved in the actual work behind it, but that kind of set me on the trajectory of understanding I needed to create a business or understand an industry such as real estate that could bring me residual income. That I found at an early age was quite the pinnacle of my success because of the fact that I knew that it had to be something that was going to sustain my expenses so that I could actually enjoy the freedom of my time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So, so you you started in did you start into real estate then after the vending machine business or how did you how did you get involved in real estate at first? So what happened there is, you know, throughout those years I was able to start transitioning like I said doing educational institutions and going to, you know, non-conventional education programs and that kind of forced me into the world of network marketing. So I was mm-hmm. involved with multiple different network marketing companies which taught me one valuable lesson, the mindset, the mindset and motivation behind them regardless of what product line it is or the service that they sold, I realized that they created a community and they pumped each other up and it was a like-minded entrepreneurial community. So that really kind of got me engaged with learning more about motivation and attending more of these events where I then at about 21, 22 years of age, you know, met my first mentor on stage, Richard Dolan, who changed my life forever. You know, I saw him speak on stage once and that was one thing that I was always fearful for was public speaking. So when I, when I saw him on stage for the first time, that kind of really shifted my mindset. And the conference that I was at at the time was one of the largest real estate investment networks in all of Canada. So I was learning about real estate. I was learning about multifamily and all these investors that had these doors. And it was a premium membership pricing, but it got me into the gates of real estate and learning now, okay, I see real estate being the biggest asset class. I see it being a powerful source. It can give me the residuals I want. Now it's how do I immerse myself in it? A lot of people try to jump into the game of real estate without understanding it first, or they go to an entry point level of getting a license and going out and transacting. Well, for me, you know, growing up even younger ages, my favorite childhood toy was Lego. So, you know, Lego was kind of that, that breaking point for me to be like, you know what, what if I could do this in real life? So I was always interested in the development concept more so of any part of real estate. So at 22, 23 at the time, my dad was also, you know, in a, he had, he was an investor in a small residential portfolio where he would have a partner that would kind of tear down some houses and they would build them up into duplexes and they would go one by one every couple of years. So at 22, I decided to, you know, get my education more so on the real estate side, connect with the right people, level up my skill sets and took over my dad's six figure portfolio at that time and converted everything into commercial. I found commercial was the game that I wanted to play because it was inspiring and empowering business owners to start their mom and pop shops. So we ended up, you know, buying three small single family homes, tearing them down and built our first commercial retail oh, wow. strip. And that was kind of the, the, the catalyst towards all the commercial real estate deals I've done since. That is cool. That is cool. And, and how many commercial real estate deals have you done at this point? And is it, is it all like storefront as well? 
Yeah, they're all retail storefronts. So that was kind of the niche that I chose, the little golden goose, golden goose of uh, real estate is what I call mm-hmm. it. Because when you're looking at that range, you're, you know, you have about eight to 10 tenants, they're mom and pop shops, you know, pizza shop, liquor store, doctor's office, pharmacy, they're in solid five to 10 year terms. And it gave the stability that I wanted, but it also gave the power and the ability to have a three to $5 million building. Mm-hmm. So at that position, I kind of realized, okay, you know what? This could be an interesting game, how people go and flip, flip homes. What if I could get into the game of learning the art of raising capital, connecting with the right people, and being able to start to actually flip a couple of these malls? So we ended up purchasing one, and within eight months, we got an offer on it, flipped that one, made some money, started rolling it in, bought another piece of land, built another building, and it, the, 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 the snowball effect just kind of took off after that point. That's incredible. That's incredible. So, and, and when you're, when you're flipping these businesses or uh, these buildings, um, are you, are you, so you're building them, are you filling them up? Are you, you know, is it like design spec? So you have a, you know, a, 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 you know, I don't know, a travel agent or something like that. So it's more like beachy themed or like a bar restaurant. So, you know, you have that, that style, you know, in there, is that basically what you're doing? And then, you know, you get the, the property generating revenue and then, then you would sell it then at that point. Exactly. So everything from the land acquisition to the full scale development at the, at the beginning, I didn't know much about construction. So what I did is I hired a general contractor to come in and I would sit there and watch and I would take notes and I would ask questions. See what I realized at an early age was If I'm going to be hiring professionals to do work, it's not just a matter of hiring the professional. It's about sitting there and learning from the Mm -hmm. professional. Mm -hmm. So I sat there and I took notes and I understood the construction. So we did the full scale construction moving forward. We would then manage the property ourselves and lease it out. So we'd work alongside our realtor partners and be able to generate, you know, leads that could now sustain their, their businesses there. And then again, we managed the property until we would either keep it as a cash flow property in our portfolio. Or we put a nice cap rate on it and sell it to an investor and, and on to the next one. Yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. And and were you doing this? Uh, obviously, this was in Canada. Were you doing this other areas as well? or Primarily Canada, yeah. The Alberta area and Calgary. Calgary is kind of the main city in Alberta, but it was actually a smaller municipality right outside. See, I saw this small city and I see I saw the development and kind of the passion and the energy. And, you know, I'm a big believer of people and I really want to kind of, you know, direct my success towards people. But it was just in that in that small municipality, I could see the the vibes and how people took care of one another. And I thought, you know what, if you can build a real humble, calm, respectful business here, you know, the people will come. People will be able to respond to that. And and that's exactly what happened in that small city of Airdrie. Love it. Love it. And now you're down in Florida, correct? What, What brought you down down there? Yeah, over the years of me getting into the real estate game and being able to build out a couple offices and start multiple different other companies in between marketing agencies, a, a restaurant, as well as a holistic clinic, you know, all that all that life experience kind of really channeled me towards, you know, really seeing what I wanted to do and how I could make true impact in the world. See, I was doing a lot with my own self there. I had built my real estate portfolio. I was living a very lavish lifestyle. I was doing good. But my purpose wasn't strong enough to being able to actually impact and empower those around me. So I decided to say, you know what, let's do something about it. And the minute that I made that decision, the global pandemic hits. Ah. Now I'm ready to make this whole big move about like, let's, let's see what the next change is for my life. And then the pandemic hits. So I go, okay, this is interesting. So while that's going through now, we're all locked at home. We're on Zoom calls now. Luckily, I had a really good community at the time with my, with my mentors and my coaches. So I was able to kind of immerse myself and keep myself motivated and focused. And that got me to really start to channel out and say, what is an area in the world? And of course, Florida came up, <laughs> mm-hmm. of course, with the, the bit of the freedom that they had here. So that was kind of interesting. But outside of that, it was looking at, you know, looking at an emerging market, seeing where there was population, but also the energy of people. So last year in 2021, during the summertime, I came out for an event my coach was hosting here in Miami, and I was able to start seeing the culture, seeing the vibe, seeing the people. And that got me really excited to say, you know what, there's a bigger market here and not even just a bigger market for me to sell or to build more buildings, which is of course something, of course, things that I want to pursue, but it was just a matter of people that I could help people that were willing and, and, and able and understanding that they wanted help. They wanted support. They needed community. So I decided to make the bold move last year after, you know, closing out one of my biggest deals and said, you know what, I'm going to move out there for six months. I'm going to go out there for the winter seasons and I'm going to go out there and see how many new connections I can build, how many more people I can interact with and see if that could be a sustainable place for me to actually, you know, transition to. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. I and you 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 touched on something there right at the end, right? So you've you've built this this great network around you uh, in Canada, right? So you have you know these these investors, and you have uh, you know the these people that know and trust you, and and all that. So you're you're obviously very very successful at networking, and then you're going to you know uproot yourself and and you know, move that you know down down south down into Florida. What would you say are some of your your biggest um, tips, advice for, you know, how to network today, right? I mean, we've got all the, you know, all the technology, you know, all of that. What what have you found the best and the quickest to be able to, you know, connect uh, on a meaningful level, right? I think a lot of times there's just sort of the surface level connection that might not ever go anywhere. You know, what does it mean for you and how do you create that, that meaningful connection that actually can lead to, you know, friendship or other business or whatever, you know, further down the road. Absolutely. So one of the, one of the main reasons of moving out here as well, too, was to kind of start fresh. You know, I had, I had been able to build up quite a lot in Canada and I was said, you know what, if I completely started fresh, how would I be able to go and actually build a network? How could I go out there and meet new people? How would I, so it was kind of a test that I gave myself as well, too. Because along the way through the coaches and mentors, like I've spent millions of dollars on my personal development, coaches, mentors that have poured their souls into me to be where I am today. So that's the number one thing. But outside of that, it was really understanding people and to understand people and networking, especially in a digital age that we live in, that we're so stuck on our phones and these social media platforms are supposed to connect us, but they're doing the complete opposite at the yeah. moment because now it's more cross comparison and more judging and more things that are now creating, you know, turbulence, I'd say in conversations and communication. But I think that what I found was the number one way to connect with anyone, anywhere, anytime was the intention. What is the true intent of you communicating with that person, having a conversation? Now, see, even a quick little thing that I do when I go to the airport every single time, I put 10 smiles on 10 faces. That's another challenge that I give myself. And it's not to get a contact information. It's not to go and, you know, have a full conversation. It's just to put smiles on faces because my intent is that. So what I realized is that, you know, we get into relationships, whether we're trying to build friendships, whether we're trying to find our lover or our spouse, whether we're trying to, you know, just really manifest our family together. It really comes down to what the intention is that you have. See, most people will go in and try to find, you know, try to pick up the girl or the boy at the bar. And their intention is, is maybe to go home with them or to, you know, become boyfriend and girlfriend or whatever that might be. But with the intent of just actually getting to know somebody and just going over and saying hello and seeing that that could just be a new friend in your world. And if that manifests to something, then great. I found that that was the biggest, the biggest point for me to have the confidence to walk up to anyone, anywhere, regardless of age, regardless of gender, regardless of color, regardless of anything. It was a matter of just a conversation that I wanted to have with a pure intent. Mm-hmm. I, and I, that's a great, that's a great perspective to approach something like that with, right? Because again, I think that, I think that people, I mean, you, you just said it, right? People get caught up in, you know, the ulterior motive of, you know, what, what I could be doing here, but just, just have that, you know, in the back of your mind, what is your intent, right? And, and, uh, you know, be, be present with that, that thought. Um, mm-hmm. I guess with that being said, do you do you have a um, a way that you are delivering this intent to people if it's not a you know face to face conversation, right? So again, we've got access to millions upon millions of people online, and you know everyone's time is so finite right now. They they mm-hmm. like how do you how do you break through? into their life and and kind of wake them up and realize hey you know this is somebody who i who i should talk to right is there any is there you know a a process that you've figured out to be able to deliver that intent in a digital manner as well absolutely well, it comes down to value you know intention is the first part but then it's the value what value are you contributing see in in a time that we live in now everyone's kind of on their own agenda everyone wants mm-hmm. something out of it and that's where I think communication is, is, is going the complete opposite direction. Because when you go in from a John Maxwell perspective of how much value can I create in your world, you come with that pure intention, but now you're also coming with deliverables. That, those deliverables allow us now, whether it's technological or it's in person, to actually create the energy in that conversation for somebody to be more interested. 
you know, I always say, you know, body language is so important when it comes to communication and nonverbals, like body language is 55%. So it's physically how I'm acting right now. 38% now is my nonverbals, my tonality, my pitch, my volume, and only 7% is the words. That's why it becomes very difficult with technology nowadays when you're texting or you're emailing, because all yeah. they're really seeing is the 7%. Now get on a phone call and it changes the game because now you increase that by the 38%. So now you're at a nice 45%, you know, to be able to really convey your message. And now things like this, video calls and, you know, video you know, messages have become such a popular thing. And I highly recommend those so that people can feel your energy. You know, it's, it's not really what people see and hear now. It's really what you can make them feel. So being able to be intuitive and having that kind of side to you that really wants to communicate that adds value in a conversation and really is there to active listen like listening is the hardest thing we do in a conversation because you know we're always just trying to think about what we're going to say next or how we're going to respond instead of actually just truly being active by listening to the other person and then being able to respond in an according manner yeah i love that and and couldn't agree more and and i think that there is there are so many instances that you know, if you just sit and listen and, and, you know, offer that advice, whether or not you even have any advice, just sometimes just the act of sitting and listening can create, you know, a great connection as well. Um, actually, have you, have you ever, um, have you heard of um, Never Split the Difference um, by, oh, I can't think what his name is. Um, it's a, it's a book. He's a hostage or an FBI hostage negotiator. Um, do you know what I'm talking about? No, but okay. Uh, Interesting. Oh, so fantastic. So, so he like actually, that. So, so um, I'm going to have to, I, I'll, I'll get you the, his name, but never split the difference is the name of the book. Uh, he was, he was an uh, ex uh, FBI hostage negotiator. And so, so their whole thing is developing that rapport and developing that connection, you know, very, very quickly. And he actually says, you know, there's a mirroring technique, right? Where you essentially just repeat the last three things that people say. And, you know, just having that sort of in the back of your mind, you know, uh, you know, like you, you were saying, you know, have intention and I could say, you know, have intention and then you would elaborate more with it and, and go deeper into whatever that is. And you develop this great relationship that, you know, you're not really even saying all that terribly much, but you're just, you know, you're getting the other person to keep that conversation going and getting deeper and deeper into that conversation. So, um, I, you know, I love that you, I love that you brought that up. Um, so you also have some other initiatives that you're part of as well, correct? Where, where you're, giving back to the youth and whatnot. Talk a little bit about, you know, what that is and how you got involved in that. So my background in psychology gave me more understanding on getting into then NLP, neuro-linguistic programming. That led to then clinical hypnotherapy. So I started to really spend many, many years for the last about five, I would say, really diving deep into the brain and understanding the brain more, the parts of the brain, how it functions, and how we can utilize that in our communication to connect with people. Now, alongside my journey of doing this and trying to build out my education and coaching business, I realized it was something that hit home right from the beginning. Because when I was 17 years old and I was lost and confused and I didn't have mentorship and I didn't even know how to seek mentorship, coming from immigrant parents that were really just like, go become a doctor, lawyer, or engineer, mm -hmm. and that's about it. And me being like, you know what, I want to really find my own pursuits and my purpose, you know. I made it a, a real staple, a real mission, a real guiding, guiding force for me to now inspire and empower the next generation. That's why my company is called Next Gen. It's a next gen group of companies, but Next Gen Wealthy is really to inspire and empower the next generation, the young guys and gals that are coming into the world now that need that leadership, that want that leadership, but don't really know how to get it. So I've made my initiative to start and launch the Next Gen Academy. That's going to be designed to actually teach these young folks communication interpersonal skills, you know, utilizing the phone for good, of course, but being able to actually be able to still do the traditional style communication mm -hmm. and then backing it with business fundamentals, personal finance and real estate investing at an early age so that they can be well-rounded regardless of what path they decide to choose in their, in their mid twenties. Uh, yeah, that's the, the, the personal connection and, and teaching young people, how to connect with people, you know, outside of texting and DMing and all of that. And yeah, incredible, incredible. 
Um, what what stage would you say that you're at with with that project? Are you are you just launching it, or what's the uh, where, where's the trajectory at right now? So it has been it has been in fruition for the last two years, just creating the content and creating the infrastructure for it. I think the catalyst to that was me actually adopting a teenager, so to speak. Ah, oh wow! Congratulations. <laughs> It was my first mentee. Actually, I met him at a conference, at a real estate conference, and uh, he was there with his mom. And they were there. He, he had one intention. He told his mom too. He said, "You know what? He was 16. He's like, I want to, I want a mentor." And three days go by the conference. It's the last day of the conference. I end up meeting his mom, and his mom's like, "You got to meet my son." So I meet him, and I was like, "Okay." And I saw something in him that I've never seen in anybody else. And I said, "Listen, you are going to help me initiate this whole process, but before." we go out to the world and show the world that we can help them and the next generation. And we're going to help all these teenagers. I'm going to just pour my heart and soul and all my knowledge into you. I'm going to make you the testimonial. I'm going to make you that poster child, my protege. So that was last December when I had met him here at a conference. And for the last year, I've been coaching and mentoring him across about the summer months is when he started to come live with me. So we okay. were living, we were traveling to, you know, Miami, we were in Tampa, we were out in Utah, going to all these different conferences and connecting while I was building his inner strength, while I was building his confidence, I was helping him unlock his purpose. I was getting him well-rounded to being able to use his speaking ability at a profound level. And that now has transitioned in this, in this last summer for us to really start to build some traction and get my group of 10 champions that I set out to find of just 10 champions. Now from one, it turned to 10. And now these 10 are helping me establish the baseline of how we're actually going to go and launch for 2023. Oh, I love it. I love it. That's yeah. That, that, that's so inspiring. That's so inspiring. And like I mentioned to you, we, we have, we have some other programs that you know, we're trying to launch and, and I love, I love the, the process that you just ex, uh, explained with, you know, how you're going about launching that. That is, that is really, really cool. Um, what, what would you say, uh, who are the, the, ideal candidates for that that program absolutely i feel it's anybody that has the energy time willpower to pursue something more now that was interesting enough because at the beginning you know i wanted my admission price to be quite substantial it was going to be a ten thousand dollar admission price mm -hmm. and it still is but the only difference with that is that some people don't have the wherewithal but still have that energy and, and attitude towards succeeding so we designed it as a dual program for those that do can, can afford that and can be put into that type of academy, absolutely, you're in with a questionnaire and a follow-up process because it's not just for anybody, but it is an application process there. Mm -hmm. On the opposite side, though, I had to think of something creative. So what we decided is we designed now a scholarship program that created a system, a systematic approach where they can go through certain learning curves and be able to complete certain programs and modules as an entrance exam in order to be then submitted into the actual academy, giving both sides actionables to being able to be a part of it, but ultimately really filtering it to the ones that are going to take the time to learn, be testimonials of the actual products themselves, and be living, demonstrating examples of the good people that we want to now breed into this world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, love it. And and what would you say uh, if you could describe what life looks like for someone who hasn't gone through the program, what that looks like today, and then what life looks like after going through the program, um, you know, the skills, the knowledge, the connections, what, what does that look like for them? Absolutely. So with without the program, it's necessarily, you know, you're kind of on your own. Mm -hmm. You know, you're, you're finishing high school, you may take a year or two off. You might be in your early 20s already, either in a degree program or still trying to figure it out as a job. And there's no real direction to find purpose. Yes, you can watch amazing videos and you can you know, follow some of these channels online, but nobody really is spending that one-on-one -on -one time. That's where I made it my quest to say, you know what, I only want a limited amount of people because my bandwidth can only go so much. And you know, Gus, my, my young guy, he's probably the biggest testimony of being through the program for an entire year now. And he's been able to scale up his language. He's been able to connect with amazing people in the rooms that I can introduce him to. He's met millionaires, billionaires. He's met some very, very powerful people. But alongside of even just meeting people and attending these conferences, he's built the inner confidence in himself. He knows that he's pursuing more. He knows that he is going to take himself and his next generation to the next mm -hmm. level. Like he talks to me about how he wants to retire his mom and how he wants to, you know, do things like that. So it's creating that type of legacy structure at an early age that allows them to start creating the discipline. Like when we went to school, it was really about discipline, tolerance, perseverance, mm -hmm. regardless of math class and social class. That's really what school was teaching us. 
So I've built the academy in such a way that it still touches base on all three of those points, but in a modern day approach, not necessarily just sitting in a classroom and trying to write out a test, actually physically going out there. And I would, I would give him tests. We would go out in public and I would say, you got to go start a conversation with them. And you would look mm-hmm. at me and you go, how Love am I supposed it. to do that? <laughs> and I'd be like, well, then yeah. that's the point. So it's real, that real life kind of experimental knowledge that, 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 get, that you get to learn mm-hmm. backed on the fundamentals, of course. I, yeah, I love it. And, and do you have any techniques with how to do that? Because again, I think that there's, like you mentioned earlier, you know, this thing, creates such a such a gap today and people are you know so afraid to to go and talk to people do you have any i guess um pointers or or sort of rules of thumb frameworks mindsets uh to to put yourself into you know when you go and and try to introduce yourself to someone new absolutely see the 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 one thing is when we go to the conferences all the time the, the first thing that people ask us is so what do you do Mm-hmm. That question, I tell you, for the last 10 years, I've been asked that question, and I really don't even know how to answer it, because it's not what I do, it's who I am. Mm-hmm. So that's an, that's an integral part to just kind of preset that with. In terms of actual techniques, first and foremost, even before we get to the actual communication and connecting with people, it's really understanding your time, your time value. And time value is so much more important because you start to actually schedule and understand what you have available in that time block that you're, that you're there in. Mm-hmm. That being said, now you're in the time block. Let's just say we set out two hours to go network and connect with people. Now it's like, well, how do I do it? How do I approach that person sitting at the bar? One massive tip that I always give is using a situational factor is what I call it. So when you're sitting there or you're standing there or you're walking alongside somebody down the street, you know, everyone is going to go for that generic approach, the generic elevator. Hey, how are you? Yeah. And as much as we're going to say, good, how are you? Like most people do. Use something that's creative. Use something that's different. Point out something that's on the street or notice that, oh, yeah, that was a great goal that the football, they, they scored that. Well, using something else to capture somebody's attention and kind of indirectly being able to open up a conversation. I think that's been one of like, you know, I spend a lot of my times networking at, you know, bars and restaurants and I love the social scene because I go out there and I get to just analyze people and really test myself and challenge myself on people that may be closed off or maybe, you know, you know, extroverted. But it's irrelevant because it's using situational factors like that to open up a conversation so that they can feel comfortable enough to start sharing, you know, who they are and what they're up to and, and all that. And then that conversation starts to build and manifest into the intention that you have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Jay, this is like extremely powerful stuff that you're sharing here. Um, If people want to learn more about you or the programs that you have, what would be the best way to, to reach out and get in touch? Best way would be, you know, my Instagram channel, Jay Dahan, J-A-Y-D-H-A-H-A-N. I post a lot of my free material content there. I do have a YouTube as well, too, but that's kind of really my focus point. So if anybody wants to reach out, feel free to reach out and we'll definitely get you more information on anything you need. Love it. Jay, thank you so much. And I want to say thank you for having me on here and any guidance, any value that I can bring to your audience. That's why I'm here. I love it. I love it. Yeah. They, I, I know that there's going to be a lot of uh, appreciation for this episode. There's a lot in here. So many thanks.